uh, yeah. Okay. So again, uh, good afternoon to everybody. And uh, uh, so here is a small uh, uh, motivation. Uh, a topological group, let me remind, is amenable <clears throat> if whenever this group acts uh, continuously on a compact space, uh, X, then X supports a regular Borel probability measure, which is invariant under the action of J. I will give more uh, <clears throat> detailed description later, it is just an introduction. So the problem that interests me uh, very much, and I'm working uh, right now on, on this problem, is uh, the following. It was suggested by two mathematical physicists uh, at the end of the last century, published in early, in early uh, zeros, I would say. Uh, suppose X is a smooth closed uh, manifold and a G a compactly group. So we can consider the group of all infinitely differentiable maps from, from this manifold to the group with pointwise operations and the C infinity topology, it is a topological group. And uh, the question is, is this group amenable in the above sense? And in spite of it being a very basic object, uh, the answer seems to be still unknown. And this problem is motivated by the uh, gauge uh, theory, by the existence of a gauge invariant vacuum state. I will not uh, talk about it because I don't really understand this uh, myself. Uh, now, uh, all that is known about the amenability of groups of maps uh, up until now, it seems, are those <clears throat> uh, results. Uh, first of all, it's, there is an old 30-year-old uh, result by Paul Maliavin, uh, Marie-Paul Maliavin, uh, who proved that the groups of continuous maps from the interval to, to a compactly group, so the group of paths and the group of loops of continuous maps from the circle to, to the Lie group, they are both amenable. <clears throat> and here the amenability is even in a stronger sense, which I will explain, stronger sense than the above definition. And uh, uh, this result, I, I will spend most of the time just to explain the ideas of the proof, because the proof seems to be uh, it's, uh, it's not non-trivial. Even if the problem is, uh, <clears throat> can be stated in such a simple language, the proof even for the, com for the continuous maps needs uh, some uh, rather advanced tools. And then uh, uh, there is my result from the past, from, well, from two years ago, actually, one year and a half, uh, that if we go up a little bit, if we go up from continuous maps, to the uh, maps slightly with a little bit more smoothness, the so-called Sobolev uh, class one, H1, then they, I cannot prove they are amenable. I don't know if they are amenable, but they have a, a property which is similar to amenability. And this property implies the existence of invariant uh, states exactly as uh, those mathematical physicists want. So I think this property may be more relevant to the problem than amenability. <clears throat> so this is an introduction. Uh, now, so sorry, I have yeah, one question yeah. on the previous slide. Yeah, sure. So you have uh, amenable you know, for, for the whole action, and then you have, in, so it's invariant uh, probability measure, and you have invariant states. And uh, that comes from, I mean, you link them to this mathematical physics uh, uh, question mm -hmm. uh, or open problem. <clears throat> Oh, the states there, where are they in the open problem? I don't uh, quite uh, see. Well, them. the state is, let's leave, leave states uh, uh, aside because it's a whole story, different story. The existence, I mean, ability does not imply in general the existence of invariant states because the action on the set of states is discontinuous in general. So uh, it's, it's a very subtle question. But this, uh, my property, which I have introduced, skew amenability, which I call this property implies the existence of invariant states. So it is, in my view, it could be more interesting than amenability, but I just don't have time to, to talk about this. For the moment, I'll just concentrate on the problem as it was stated by Carey and uh, Grenling. Yeah, so, so you know, this attracted my attention just because states in uh, some continuous model theory, and especially connected to operator algebras, uh, yeah. what we call types in uh, I mean they, they can be connected to types as uh, uh, Alex Berenstein also has shown uh, here so maybe we can 
start uh, you know thinking of a possible translation of this ah, maybe yeah okay thanks for the for the comment yeah all right i will i will think about it now uh, so uh, <clears throat> uh, once again the the basic definition uh, if we have a topological group g then whenever it acts on a, on a compact space right just in the usual in the usual very familiar sense we have a continuous action there is a regular Borel probability measure which is invariant under this uh, action for every Borel subset a of, of x the measure of the translate by any element of the group is the same right so the the first example I will just give some very basic uh, information on amenability first and then it will become more advanced uh, for instance, a compact group is, is amenable. It's enough to fix the uh, Haar measure, the unique invariant probability measure on the group. And you basically push it forward along any orbit on the, on the space X, right? You fix any point C, and then the uh, push forward measure given by this formula is an invariant measure on X. So that's the simplest example. Now, an abelian group is is amenable, even if it obviously typically doesn't have an invariant measure. But uh, given a finite subset of an amenable group, one can uh, form uh, this uh, Faulner set, uh, which is the, the sum of uh, copies of F union with minus F. And if, uh, if you make it big enough, then uh, the Faulner set has a problem that the symmetric difference of its of, of this set with its translate by a fixed element is relatively small, right? Uh, the number of elements is uh, small relative to the size of the set. And then we uh, can get any, can take any accumulation point of the corresponding counting probability matters, empirical probability matters on the space X, and it's an invariant probability measure. The, and the, of course, there is a counterexample, the uh, standard counterexample, the free group on two generators, which is not, uh, not amenable with the discrete topology. And it's, uh, it's a very simple argument. As the compact space, it's enough to take the stone check uh, compactification of the group. And then we uh, form every element of the free group can be written as uh, an irreducible word. And it will necessarily start with either A or A minus one or B or B minus one. So we can split uh, the group into the union of those four sets plus the identity. Now take the closures of those four sets in, in the stone check compactification. And uh, the, on the one hand, the group is the union of those five sets of those five closures. closures. On the other hand, it's easy to check that it's a union of the translates of uh, two of them starting with AB or starting with A minus one, B minus one, which obviously contradicts the existence of an invariant matter. So that's a canonical counterexample. Now, if we go to infinite dimensional groups, infinite dimensional in a very loose sense, they are not, ah, well, the, the origin is of course the Banach-Tarski paradox, but I will uh, skip it. Analysis by uh, John von Neumann of uh, Banach-Tarski paradox, and uh, for infinite dimensional groups, the examples are very, uh, very numerous. Uh, for instance, the unitary group in the strong operator topology, the group of automorphisms of the Lebesgue uh, probability space with a coarse topology, the group of uh, permutations of the natural numbers with a topology of simple convergence. The group of automorphisms of the rationals, the group of homeomorphisms of real line, and so on. Many other examples are known. And uh, uh, of course, some of them are, uh, have an even stronger property the extreme amenability, uh, which is now uh, uh, relatively well understood in, in terms of the uh, Ramsey theory of uh, structures, either discrete or continuous. Uh, but what, what I want to, uh, to, uh, uh, to advertise is that 
many groups, there are many natural groups, equally interesting, equally important groups of diffeomorphisms and smooth maps, right? Because groups of smooth maps are a particular case of groups of diffeomorphisms. And uh, for those groups, I mean, ability is not understood. There are not many examples of uh, uh, groups of smooth maps or diffeomorphisms for which you can say if it's amenable or not. Even for groups of continuous maps, for instance, uh, let me state this uh, question, which seems to be open. Let X be a compact space, any compact space, T of compact space, and let G be a compact group. Then is necessarily the group of continuous maps from X to G with the uniform convergence topology, which is a topological group, amenable or not. And it's enough for very simple reasons, enough to consider the case where G is a compact Lie group uh, using the structure theory of compact groups, it, it reduces. One can uh, assume G is a compact group, one can assume X is a metrizable compact space, even it's enough, uh, I believe, to prove for uh, finite dimensional compact spaces, I think so. But the question remains open, even if, the, the answer is positive if X is totally disconnected, but this is totally trivial argument. Uh, it's totally trivial, I'm pretty sure it's well known. In, uh, in the folklore, uh, but uh, if X is connected, uh, it's already unknown. And for X, as I mentioned, uh, the interval of the, the circle, uh, it's, it's Maliavan Maliavan. It's a very non-elementary non, non proof actually, which I will outline. And already for the square, it seems unknown. Even if X is the square, I, I don't think the answer is known for this question. So, uh, it's more convenient to work not with the invariant measures sometimes, but with invariant means. So let me just give a, a quick uh, motivation why. Let X act on a compact space, a topological group, right? And fix a function F on this compact space. Okay, this is a function F, continuous function. This is a compact space. This is acting group. And a point C in, in, the, in the space. Now, uh, the composition of the orbit map, right, taking an element of the group, multi then we multiply C by this element, and we evaluate the function F at this point. This is a map from the group to the scalars, real or complex numbers. It is bounded clearly and right uniformly continuous, right uniformly continuous in the, in the sense of Bourbaki. Uh, that uh, for every epsilon there exists a neighborhood such that if V, if G, H minus one belongs to V, then the function oscillation of the function between G and H is less than epsilon. And moreover, every uh, right uniformly continuous bounded function on the group is obtained in this way from some suitable action. And uh, invariant probability measures on, on the space, they correspond to positive functionals of norm one on, on right uniformly continuous functions. So using the risk representation theorem, one can make this uh, translation. And uh, amenability is equivalent to the existence of a left invariant mean on, 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 on the space of right uniformly continuous bounded functions. So we will work with this. Now, uh, right, a few properties of amenable groups, which are uh, very uh, well known, not, not uh, simple mostly. If we have a dense topological subgroup of a group G, then G is amenable if and only if the dense subgroup is amenable. Now, if H, a normal subgroup, is amenable and G over H, the quotient group is amenable, then G is amenable itself. Three space uh, property, extension property. Now, if you have an image of an amenable group under a surjective homomorphism, then this image is amenable as well. And for locally compact groups only, if you have a locally compact group and amenable subgroup and, and the subgroup of it, then this subgroup is always amenable. A subgroup of an amenable group is amenable. Close or not close, it doesn't matter. A topological subgroup of a locally compact amenable group is amenable, but it is no longer true if G is not locally compact. And uh, for those infinite dimensional groups, it's only true in exceptional uh, circumstances, I would say. And this is a, a problem, of course, uh, because we cannot 
uh, hope to give proofs of amenability like that, proving that a big group is amenable, our group sits inside, so it's amenable. Let me give you an example. Even if we know that every metrizable compact space is a, is a quotient space of the contour set, right? The image under a surjective continuous map of the contour set. As a consequence, the group of continuous functions on metrizable compact space X can be embedded as a closed subgroup of the group of continuous map on the contour set. And group of continuous maps with values in, in a compact group, even in an amenable group, G, is amenable simply because uh, if you look at the subgroup consisting, if you, you fix a finite partition of, of the contra set, right? Finite partition and open and closed sets. And look at all simple functions, functions which are constant on element of this partition. This subgroup is isomorphic as topological group to the nth power of, of G the n is the cardinality of the partition, right? So this way, if you take finer and finer partitions, you get the union of uh, amenable subgroups. The union of amenable subgroups is uh, of an increasing chain is amenable. It is dense in the whole thing. So the, the group of maps from, from the counter space to any amenable group is amenable. But even if our group uh, CG, CXG sits inside as a closed subgroup. We cannot conclude it because we cannot pass to amenability of subgroups. It's only true in very, very exceptional cases. Uh, for instance, if the left and right uniformities of the group are equal and the group is co compact, then you can prove it. But uh, in general, no, it's not true. Now, how let's have a look at, at a proof, one possible of many, many proofs of amenability of the real line. So we, we can uh, uh, look at the, uh, uh, the following probability measure on the real line. Uh, centered normal distribution with variance T, positive variance T given by, by the, the usual bell curve. So when the variance goes to infinity, it, it kind of flattens out, right? Gets more and more spread out in the real line. And uh, let us do the following. Let us fix an element, let's say x equals three, something like that, some fixed element. And let us translate those measures. Obviously they're not invariant, right? They're not invariant those measures. But uh, if we translate them by some fixed value and uh, 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 look at, uh, at what happens. So did I write the correct thing? I guess, yeah. And if you look what, what happens with the uh, uh, translates, then they will converge the, the difference between them. Uh, will, uh, okay, so I didn't write what I wanted to say, but uh, the exact statement would be that the uh, total variation distance between, between this measure and by it translates, translate by three, it will go to zero. It will go to zero. The total variation distance between those will, will go to zero. Uh, so uh, here are a few pictures for when variance grows. They're not very convincing. Well, this, this one is better, variance 40. So, I mean, you, 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 you can see that those measures are more and more alike. So this uh, formally it's given by this statement that uh, the total variation distance is, is getting uh, uh, getting close to zero. So now if we take uh, the uh, fix a free ultra filter on, on the variances and take the ultra limit of those integrals, then uh, this ultra limit is invariant mean, invariant mean. So that's one possible proof for the real line. Now, uh, we want to do it for, for a group which is infinite dimensional. So of course, the same argument can be applied to Rn. For Rn, we, we just do the Gaussian measure, which is the nth power of the n, product of n copies of the one dimensional uh, normal distribution. And uh, uh, this, uh, this argument applies to, uh, to, to Rn. We can use the uh, n dimensional Gaussians to prove the amenability of Rn. But in our case, we are dealing with a group uh, which is infinite dimensional in some sense, right? So we, we need some kind of an equivalent of Gaussian measure, probably if you want to use this argument for infinite dimensional case. 
And uh, 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 such an equivalent is given by the Wiener measure. So the first uh, obvious question is, uh, can we define the analog of Gaussian measure for L2? So in other words, for the infinite dimensional Hilbert space, does there exist a probability measure in L2 with the property, the following property, which is a defining property of the finite dimensional Gaussian measure. If we take the orthogonal projection of this measure in any direction, then we get a one dimensional, uh, one dimensional uh, uh, normal distribution or more generally, if you project on an N dimensional space, we get N dimensional uh, Gaussian distribution. So can we hope to have such a measure on L infinity? on L2, sorry, L2. But it's easy to check that uh, it's, uh, it's an exercise which uh, takes a little bit of effort perhaps, but it's not difficult to verify that any such measure would, uh, if, if you want it to be sigma uh, finite dimensional, it will satisfy the property that the measure of the whole space is zero. It's simply because the measure of any ball, uh, you can check it, it ought to be zero from, from this condition. So such a measure does not exist. And this situation is a little bit like if you want to construct a sigma additive measure on the rational numbers uh, with the property that the measure of every interval is equal to its length. Uh, such a measure, of course, uh, doesn't exist because sigma additivity gives that the measure of the whole set of rational numbers uh, ought to be zero. And so we have to kind of beef up the rational numbers. We have to take uh, a completion of it, a bigger, bigger space which is thicker, which is able to support a measure with, with this uh, property that, that we want, which, which is the rational numbers in this case. And uh, uh, in the same way, the Wiener measure has to be supported on bigger space than L2. And one, one candidate for such a, a measure would be the countable power of the real line, R to the N, in which case we can just take the infinite product of uh, copies of of one dimensional normal distribution. And this space, of course, it seems to be a, a bit uh, too, too large. In particular, it is not, uh, not even a norm space, right? Not even normable space, it's a free space. But fortunately, there are many intermediate spaces which are uh, in between the our L2 and Rn, which, which are much smaller than Rn, and yet they have a full measure under this uh, infinite uh, Gaussian measure, right? So there is, uh, there are even, uh, there are Banach spaces with this property, there are Hilbert spaces with this property. And uh, there is a criterion, which is uh, easy to, to state actually for a norm on L2 to have the property that if you take the completion, then the measure of this completion is one. The, the Gaussian measure is one. So uh, the so-called measurable norms, a little bit misleadingly perhaps. And uh, a triple, which consists of, uh, our Hilbert space L2 and uh, 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 a Banach space E into which it is continuously embedded with the property that uh, the, the measure of this E is, is one. It uh, allows the extension of the, of the uh, uh, measure in the way we want. It's called an abstract winner space. And the example that we will, will, will use in this problem is the uh, historically the first example, the classical Wiener space. So the classical Wiener space consists of, it's a triple, which consists of uh, L2, the, the Hilbert space of uh, square integrable functions on the unit interval with the Lebesgue measure. And the space of, uh, uh, let's say a continuous function uh, vanishing at, uh, at, uh, at zero. And uh, uh, the, uh, embedding is done uh, like this. Uh, given a function f, which is square integrable, we uh, construct this uh, continuous function, absolutely continuous function actually, which is the integral from zero to t of f of s ds. And then this element belongs to, to the space of continuous functions. This way we get this continuous embedding. And this uh, construction is a key to, to treat the, the group of continuous maps actually. Now the question is, uh, right, uh, two more remarks, two more remarks, which we need to finish the, the tools. Uh, if you have an abstract Wiener space, then first of all, 
uh, it contains uh, our space L2, our Hilbert space, in a very nice way. Every unitary operator on this uh, L2, every rotation, right, every asymmetry of L2, extends over this uh, completion E, extends uh, almost everywhere as, as an operator, almost defined almost everywhere, and it leaves the measure invariant. So every unitary operator is a measure preserving. Uh, can be thought as a measure preserving operator on this uh, thickening of our space. And uh, translations, what happens with translations? Translations by elements of L2 of, of this bigger space E, and only those translations, leave the measure not invariant, but quasi invariant. Quasi invariant meaning that the translation of the measure is, uh, is equivalent, a measure which is equivalent to the original measure. It's, it can be written as uh, the original our Gaussian measure times some function f, the Radonic derivative of the translate. And a slightly more general construction is being a measure of parameter t, of parameter t, of positive parameter t. Uh, if we start in our construction of infinite product, then restriction, if we start instead of a normal distribution, standard normal distribution, with variance one, we can start with a centered normal distribution of variance t. Then we get this Wiener measure of parameter t. And uh, now a direct calculation can be done showing that uh, basically the, if we shift it by some fixed value epsilon, then the, uh, 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 what happens that the, the integral becomes in the limit integral taken with regard to uh, this uh, measure of parameter t gets more and more invariant, asymptotically invariant. And that's pretty much what, what is needed for, uh, for the uh, to define the invariant means. Now let us try to use to put those tools together in order to, to prove amenability. So now uh, a quick introduction into, as it is a, a seminar, uh, of logic and model theory into, into Lie groups. So let G be a compact Lie group with Lie algebra G. What does it mean? It means that G is a smooth compact manifold with a smooth, infinitely smooth group uh, operation. And uh, G is just the tangent space to G at identity and uh, the equipped with a Lie bracket, which is a bilinear map. And it is a second degree approximation to the uh, multiplication law at identity. So more exactly, there is a, a local, there is a smooth map, which is called the exponential map from, from the Lie algebra to the Lie group, which is a local diffeomorphism. And uh, it, it has uh, the, well, the property, first of all, that the image of every line passing through zero is a subgroup. It's called one parameter subgroup. And uh, uh, so if you restrict exponential map on, on a one dimensional line, it's, uh, it's a group isomorphism between, between the additive line and the, well, it's a homomorphism more exactly homomorphism. And uh, also uh, the uh, product of images of two elements, which are sufficiently close to zero, can be approximately written as the image of their sum plus one half of the bracket and plus higher order terms. So this is what, uh, what it means that it's a second degree approximation to, uh, to the operation. Now, every uh, compact Lie group can be realized as a subgroup, closed subgroup of the group of orthogonal matrices, orthogonal unitary matrices of finite rank. And uh, then we have the, uh, a joint representation of, of the group in, in the Lie algebra, which is simply the action by conjugation, by conjugation, the action of a, of a matrix G, which is a, an orthogonal matrix or unitary matrix on an element X, an element of the Lie algebra is just the product, the conjugation by G of, of X. And uh, uh, there exists an uh, in the product on, on G, which is invariant under this action, uh, under the action of any compact group, actually have an invariant in a product. Now, an important uh, tool, uh, two uh, very important tool, uh, which, uh, which shows that even if we, are we deal with continuous maps, we need uh, smoothness. 
So suppose we have a function which is uh, with values in a Lie group, which is smooth at some point t. Then we can define the so-called right logarithmic derivative of this function at, at this point t. The right logarithmic derivative of t is the following. It is, we take the usual derivative, right? F prime of t, but the usual derivative takes values where? At the tangent space at this point. We wanted to take values in the Lie algebra. So we just translate it. We just shift it by f of t. We shift it back to, to identity. So this is uh, the right logarithmic derivative. It's just the usual derivative, but we make it take values in the same tangent space in the, in the Lie algebra. It takes values in the Lie algebra. And a direct calculation shows the so-called cocycle rule. It's a simple calculation which shows that the right logarithmic derivative of the product of two functions is given by this. It is the derivative of the first function plus the derivative of the second function, but acted upon by the uh, adjoint representation by the values of the function at this point t. So this is the uh, cocycle rule. The, it's kind of a deformation of the addition in, in the of the functions taking values in the Lie algebra. So this cocycle rule allows to prove amenability. We, we need this, uh, this tool. Uh, and now let us define this uh, group, which I mentioned, H1. It is called a finite energy path group, group of paths of finite energy. So uh, suppose we have uh, a map from the interval to the Lie group, which is absolutely continuous, right? In, in the usual sense of uh, classical analysis, it's absolutely continuous. And an absolutely continuous map has the right, has the derivative, usual derivative, defined uh, almost everywhere in the sense of Lebesgue measure, right? As a consequence, it has the right logarithmic derivative defined almost everywhere as well. Uh, so we can talk about the right logarithmic derivative of this map defined almost everywhere. And we say that such a path, such a map has finite energy if the uh, right logarithmic derivative is square integrable because it takes values in the, in the Lie algebra, which is a Hilbert space. So we can, uh, with this invariant uh, in a product, so we can integrate the square of the uh, norm of, of the right logarithmic derivative. And if it is finite, we say that the path, regional path F has finite energy. Now, uh, this map, right, so I forgot to include, I mean, okay. Here it is, I should have put it here. The uh, set of uh, all paths of finite energy is denoted uh, H1. And uh, so uh, it, it forms, uh, forms uh, a group, uh, which is called H1 IG. It's a finite energy path group. Sometimes it is also called the group of maps of uh, Sobolev class one, which is equivalent the same. And uh, it can be realized. The important thing is its realization. Using the cocycle, we can realize it as a group of maps with values in the Lie algebra as follows. The right logarithmic derivative of a function, okay, which I remind is uh, defined by, uh, by, by this, uh, I cannot underline it, by this formula, right. Uh, it's subjective, it's subjective actually because the uh, inverse is given by the so-called product integral, by the so-called an analog of integration with values in, in a Lie group. There is a technique to prove that it's, uh, it's uh, surjective. It is not injective because if you shift a path, if you multiply a path by a constant map, right? It will have the same derivative, obviously, but it becomes injective on the path, on the based path which take value identity at zero of the interval, the left hand point of the interval, it becomes injective. So the group of based paths of finite energy, H10, Ig, it can be identified with the map, the, the, the space of all L, uh, square integrable maps from the interval to the Lie algebra. And- Let me ask you a question. 
Yes. Um, when usually you have a subtle left space, you take the integral of the function squared and you also take the integral of the derivative squared. Here you only have this. Yeah, because in, exactly because they are based for the based uh, pass uh, those two norms are equivalent right oh, okay okay so Thanks. that's why yep. that's why okay and uh, uh, not taking the function is good because this one is going to be a joint a joint uh, invariant under the joint action this uh, norm l2 norm that's why it's more convenient and what is more uh, most remarkable is that we can transfer the group operation because of this cos cycle, the cos cycle uh, rule, which I showed on the previous slide. This one allows to transfer the group operation as follows: the the product of two maps with values L two maps with values in the Lie algebra is given by the first map plus the second map upon which we act pointwise by by the uh, uh, image of the first function under this product integral. So we can explicitly define a group operation. From now on, we can work, we can forget about the group with values in, in a uh, functions with values in a Lie group. We can work directly with a group with values in the Lie algebra, which is much easier. Of course, Lie algebra is a linear object, right? It's kind of linear space. And uh, uh, now we can prove, we can outline the proof of the uh, theorem Malieva and Malieva, that the group of maps, continuous maps from the unit integral to a compact Lie group is amenable. So we start with a compact Lie group G, right? Now we note that uh, the group of uh, those uh, uh, finite energy or Sobolev class one functions is dense. In, in continuous obviously groups, right? Because it contains, for instance, C infinity functions, uh, it is dense. And uh, let me remind you that we have now a new realization of this group uh, based of based maps. By the way, uh, based maps, it's, it's a group which is very big inside of, of all, right? Because it's a co-compact group. If you take, uh, if you, it's a compact group, so it's very big. If you prove that this is amenable, then this will be amenable too. So it's really everything reduces to this group. Uh, and the realization of this group, it is just square summable functions with this product, with these products, which is a deformation of addition. And uh, the isomorphism between those two groups is established by this product integral or by the uh, right logarithmic derivative in the other direction. Now, an advantage of this space L2 is that we can construct, we can consider Wiener measures on this space, a family of Wiener measures of parameter T under the immersion. Okay, we can construct on, on, on all the space of all functions, group of all fun, uh, space of all functions, linear space, continuous functions on the interval with various in the Lie algebra. The algebra is a finite dimensional space, right? Finite dimensional Hilbert space. And uh, the Hilbert space, which will define the Wiener measure is uh, just our L2, this space L2 with values in G, but the immersion is like in the classical Wiener space, given a function from, from this space, we uh, send it to the uh, antiderivative of this function, antiderivative, which will be, which will be absolutely continuous function, taking values in G. So this uh, viewed from this angle, the space of continuous functions with values in, in the Lie algebra will be a completion of square summable functions with a weaker norm because our embedding is sort of a twisted embedding, right? Special embedding. It's not the canonical embedding, but this under the antiderivative map. And now uh, uh, the, the group uh, H1, H1 of based path, which sits inside of L2, it acts on C. It acts on this completion because this completion is a bigger space. It's a completion under a certain norm. And it acts, uh, this action can be extended over this completion. It can be extended. And this action consists of what? Uh, 
So it is the first function plus a transformation of the second function by the joint representation. The joint representation is a unitary. So first of all, we apply a unitary operator on the second function, then we shift it. Unitary operator leaves the winner measure fixed. And the shift by an element of L2 has the property that if the parameter of the winner measure goes to infinity, then the shift becomes less and less felt. The total variation distance between, between the shifted measure and the original one goes to zero. So as a result, as a result, if we take fix any free ultra filter with the, which contains intervals from T to plus infinity on the real line, they fix any such ultra filter and uh, form the ultra limit of the integrals. And those integrals will, uh, this ultra limit is a mean, invariant mean. And of course, this mean is defined not just of the, on the, uh, okay, this is a mean. Uh, which is invariant under the action of this subgroup. The problem is, of course, it's on the wrong space because it's on the space of continuous functions taking values in the Lie algebra. We don't want this space. We want the group of continuous functions taking values in the Lie group. But, so it remains to transfer this measure to our group. And it is being done, uh, it is being done using the product integral map, the product integral map. Uh, this map uh, is defined almost everywhere. One can show its extension is defined almost everywhere. Uh, it's called ETO map and uh, a particular case of the ETO map. And uh, as we do this extension, our winner measure can be pushed down to a measure on the group of continuous maps with values in, in the Lie algebra in this one. This one. Uh, now we have a measure here. A probability family of uh, probability measures, rather family of probability measures, and they are asymptotically invariant under the action of this subgroup. So we conclude uh, that we have a mean, uh, and this mean is defined, of course, because it's a genuine probability measure. You can integrate any measurable function, any measurable function. You can integrate any Borel function or any absolutely measurable function. So we have a mean on all bounded Borel functions on this group, which is invariant, but not under the action of any element, but only of this uh, subgroup, hence of this subgroup, which is just slightly bigger uh, of, of all uh, groups of finite uh, energy, in particular, of all C1 maps. Uh, so uh, in particular, we did use amenability from this. So th this property is stronger, is strictly stronger than amenability. We have a mean unbounded Borel functions, but it's, it's uh, invariant under the action of a dense subgroup. It's strictly stronger than amenability. It implies amenability, but not vice versa. And uh, in particular, we get amenability of the group. So this is uh, the technique one needs to prove amenability of this group. And now uh, uh, I hope that uh, at least uh, uh, something will remain, so this is a discussion. Now, uh, there are very big technical difficulties trying to extend the argument either to the next, next degree of smoothness, already to H1, or to higher dimensions. And uh, in both cases, the reason is the same. When we try to use the co-cycle formula, it exists. It exists, it can be written for both uh, higher, higher smoothness, for both for higher dimension manifold, it can be done, but it acquires higher order terms, higher order terms. And under those terms, at least the standard winner measure, any or any modifications of those obvious modifications are no longer asymptotically invariant. They don't no longer have this property that when we shift the, the distance, uh, total variation distance goes to zero, it doesn't happen. So that's a big technical difficulty, which, uh, I'm quite uh, absorbed in right now. And let me show uh, another approach uh, to remaining slides. And I have exactly, exactly, I think, four minutes to finish. Uh, we can try to do it without winner measure as well. So what happens in this case? And uh, something interesting happens. So let me show this uh, low tech approach, so to speak. We can try to construct a sequence of probability measures 
which are supported not on an infinite dimensional uh, space, but on a finite dimensional one in the same way, uh, which, are, which converge to invariance weakly, not in the sense of a total variation distance, which is a very, very strong sense of convergence, but in a, in a sense of weak convergence with regard to right uniformly continuous bounded functions, for instance. And uh, uh, so we realize again our group as a group of maps with values in the Lie algebra, uh, uh, Lie algebra, right? And uh, uh, from the interval to, to the Lie algebra. And because the multiplication operation is written in terms of rotations and translations, right? Translations and uh, actions by the joint representation. Uh, we can uh, just enough to show that those uh, measures are asymptotically invariant under translations and rotations, nothing else. So what we do, we partition the interval into n subintervals, let's say, and we look at the group or at the space, Hilbert space of this dimension, dimension n, number of elements of the partition, which are constant on elements of the partition. It's a finite dimensional Euclidean subspace. On this subspace, you can define the Gaussian measure, the usual Gaussian measure, right? And then we can take a refinement of this partition and send this to, to infinity. And what you can do, you, you still have to, to do some non-trivial stuff. You can use some mass transportation estimates and concentration of measure estimates. But you can conclude that there exists a left invariant mean on the following functions, on bounded uniformly continuous functions on L2. Okay, bounded uniformly continuous. What do they correspond if, if we think of it as a group, right? Remember that we realized our group as this space L2 with values and the Lie algebra uh, with a special uh, deformed operation. And it turns out that the additive uniform structure on, on, on L2 on this Hilbert space corresponds to the left uniform structure on, on our topological group. So it is not amenability. If you remember, amenability requires an invariant mean on the right uniformly continuous bounded functions, but we only have it on the left uniformly continuous bounded. And this is a property which uh, I, I, I called, uh, well, it's not me uh, who called it, was Martin Schneider. He suggested to call it skew amenability, and I like it. Uh, skew amenability. Uh, it does not follow from amenability. There are counterexamples. Uh, I don't know if it implies amenability. It seems to be an open uh, question yet. But it seems to be exactly a version of amenability, which is needed to construct invariant states, actually. I, I don't have time to explain it. So it is very good. I didn't try to, to jam it in. But it's, uh, it's a nice, uh, nice construction. So maybe the right question is not whether the groups of smooth, infinitely smooth maps from a manifold to a Lie group are amenable, but if they are skew amenable in the sense of view def this definition, that at least this is a legitimate question because skew amenability exactly resolves this motivation, original motivation by those mathematical physicists. So I will only uh, give one uh, reference, which is my. Uh, a recently published paper, you can find references to Malevan Malevan, a discussion and, uh, and everything. So that's it. Thank you very much for, and I'm ready to answer maybe a couple of questions. We have time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, we have uh, some time for, you know, a few minutes for, for questions, of course. Uh, so we have questions from anyone. Uh, yes, I have one question. Uh, strong amenability implies skew amenability? A strong amenability in the sense of Glasner. I don't know. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure. I, I need to think because my counterexample and I, no, no, it doesn't. Even extreme amenability doesn't imply. Even extreme amenability and every extremely amenable group is strongly amenable. So uh, if you mean the same, uh, the same uh, definition. Uh, given by Eli Glasner in his book, right? I think he was talking of strong amenability. Uh, I think no, I think not, doesn't. Because the counterexample is the unitary group uh, of an infinite dimensional separable Hilbert space with a strong topology. It is amenable, it is extremely amenable, but uh, it's not uh, skew amenable, doesn't have skew amenability. Okay, thank you. How closed is skew amenability? I mean, you... 
uh, described a little bit amenability being closed under various things like uh, in subgroups in some cases or uh, sometimes uh, or if a quotient is uh, amenable and uh, the small subgroup is also amenable then uh, it behaves horribly behaves horribly okay. for for locally compact groups q amenability i should say it's just the usual amenability it's equivalent Oh, okay. A locally compact case. But beyond locally compact, it behaves horribly. It does, it's not closed under extensions. Martin Schneider and Kate Yushenko have counterexamples constructed. It, uh, it's not closed under completions. They also have a counterexample and so on. So it behaves horribly. It's very, very fragile, this property. Uh, very fragile. Right. However, you, you think it is a right uh, replacement? I think it is right because it gives, whenever I have a theorem that whenever a skew amenable uh, topological group uh, is uh, represented, uh, if you have a unitary representation of a skew amenable group, then this unitary representation is what Becker calls uh, is an amenable representation, means it admits an invariant mean on the space, invariant state conjugation invariant state on the space of operators of the space of representation. So from this viewpoint, this is exactly what you want in uh, quantum field theory and those applications. Right, I think, uh, yeah. Hmm. Well, this seems to be, uh, but I'm not, uh, you know, there are people here who have been, uh, like Juan Felipe and uh, Alex Bernstein and the, uh, in a different uh, la, uh, direction, Goyo and of course Ward Hanson have been looking at you know several connections between um, constructions, but more like extreme amenability, or I don't know, and uh, their kind of interpretation in the continuous model theory, for instance, or in Ramsey theory. Ramsey, uh, theory. No, and uh, I, I just um, I'm surprised that. Uh, uh, for for this set of group actions that you have been uh, looking at uh, today, it seems to. I mean, the tools seem close, perhaps, but uh, it's uh, it's it's at a very very early stages because there is very little known about uh, I mean ability of uh, of the smooth uh, groups of smooth maps groups of different morphisms. It seems very little is known. So who knows? I mean, at the beginning, those extremely amenable groups seem to be ab abomination, right? Uh, ugly counterexamples at the beginning. I think we have a question by Ward, or well, it's a speculation. Um, some of the, some of the things you you did uh, reminded me of the work of people like Nigel Cutland studying Wiener measure within non-standard an analysis, and I wondered if you. Uh, if this made sense to you, if you thought about it at all? Uh... Well, it's, uh, it, it makes sense to me, yes. It makes sense to me, yes. Because when I prepared this, uh, this talk, I, I thought that maybe a better way would be to, to try to present it in a non-standard way exactly. I was looking at those presentations, but then I decided it would be perhaps uh, just as complicated. But it makes a lot of sense, yes, to try to, uh, uh, to, to look at it from the non-standard uh, hyperfinite viewpoint as well yes yes oh, it makes sense that's, okay good uh, non-standard hulls this type of construction yes 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 could be uh, could make sense for uh, loop and pass groups yes mm -hmm. and you also seem to be taking well you, you explicitly spoke about ultra limits in your uh, uh, constructions but, uh, but this seems to be happening in some sort of a nice you know metric ultra power or ultra power or something in between uh well, it's, i think it's just color. here here ultra limit is just uh, just yeah, a technical yeah. tool which is very commonly used in abstract harmonic analysis to get uh, invariance uh, sure. in the limit right you can either take cluster points uh, in a compact space or ultra limits and here it doesn't really matter to me ultra yeah. limits is is easier and more kind of i like them more than mm -hmm. taking cluster points yeah in this case, the connection was more suggested by the name of it than by what uh, what the mathematical object really no. is. But uh, uh, here, it's I don't uh, think it's uh, too promising. I mean, it's really here. It's really technical usage of this. Very technical. Just technical. Huh. 
you have asymptotically invariant integrals, and what's easier than to take uh, an ultra limit to get an invariant mean? Mm -hmm. huh. Right. Any more uh, quest questions or, uh, or comments? Or... Well, if not, then uh, let us thank uh, the speaker again. Thanks a lot. Really, yeah, uh, everybody. Um, kind of mind provoking in many, in many directions. And I think to many of us, hopefully at some point, there will be some more connections between, uh, you know, parts of mathematical logic and, and uh, what you spoke about today. Thank you very much. Thanks and, uh, so, so, uh, so the seminar continues, well, there'll be a lecture on, on, uh, on Friday by, by Jim Freitag. Uh, so you should just check the web page. And um, thank you again, and uh, till, till Friday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.